Yeah, that's right. This thing has a dedicated pizza button. It does one thing and one thing only, order pizza. A glorious existence indeed. And the way it performs this most noble of tasks is by connecting to the internet through this thing. The Netpliance Eye Opener NP1000, released in the fall of 1999 by Netpliance Incorporated out of Austin, Texas. Though specifically what I have here is the 2001 model, misleadingly released in the year 2000, a thing that is the world's simplest way to get internet and email, apparently. Along with all kinds of web goodies like news, weather, sports, stocks, shopping, and more, it's not a PC, it's for people who don't want a PC. Even though inside it's still a PC, but we'll get to that. The eye-opener was geared towards the internet curious, folks new to computers or anyone seeking a way to just do email without buying a full desktop. Eye-opening stuff, and even more so when you hear its price, $99. Seriously, that was it, for the entire system with an LCD monitor. Granted, it was a crappy passive matrix DSTN, but who cares? Nobody was playing games or video on here, it's all text and photos. And at a time when most LCD monitors alone cost multiple times more than this entire system, $99 for an eye-opener seemed infeasible, because it was. It reportedly cost nearly $500 to manufacture. Which was done by Quanta Computer in Taiwan, by the way, known at the time for making laptops for Dell and HP. And that's effectively what you have here, an x86 laptop crammed into an upright form factor with a stripped-down operating system, and the whole idea was minimizing cost to shift as many units as possible to secure a market foothold. Netpliance sold it at a loss and banked on the age-old strategy of subsidizing, not only charging $21.95 a month to use the device, but also partnering with brands, websites, and other third parties to promote products and services through the eye-opener. Including that pizza key, which originally... When pressed would order Papa John's pizza specifically, as stated in contemporary articles I dug up. Although Netpliance also stated that if the Papa deal fell through, there were always other deals on the table for anyone who wanted a slice of the pie. And according to later reviews, by 2001, pressing the pizza key simply brought up a web page of phone numbers for nearby pizza joints instead, like mine is presumably trying and failing to do. On that note, yeah, the eye-opener hasn't been usable for ages now, at least not in its original connected form. Despite its x86 internals, it's not a full PC out of the box and relied on Netpliant's online services to function. Services long since taken down, with the hardware here becoming a largely forgotten relic from the time of internet appliances. And for a few short years around the turn of the millennium, standalone email and web boxes like this were sprouting up like weeds, and Netpliance was one of the earliest to buy in. The idea was to build products that weren't PC-based that could connect to the internet. Today, if you look at projections for internet connections, they grow tremendously compared to the number of personal computers being manufactured. So in the end, the PC and the internet are no longer synonymous. In fact, the PC is becoming much more like the mainframe and is, is old technology. And this rhetoric was commonplace. Trade shows, the media, and every other tech entrepreneur with a pulse talked of the end of traditional PCs for the age of cheaper standalone web devices was upon us. According to a 1999 report by International Data Corp, this device category was expected to be worth $15 billion by 2002, and companies rushed to capitalize. You had the 3Com Audrey, the Honeywell WebPad, Compaq MSN Companion, the ePods One, Intel Dot Station, Sony eVilla, Gateway AOL Touchpad, and so many, many more. But yet, Netpliance was a prime early example with a machine that wasn't plug-and-play, it's plug-and-playful, claiming to be the first of its kind with an instant-on, simple browserless view of the web, like George Jetson meets Martha Stewart. Although in that initial reveal, it was known as the eye-opener Internet Personal Access Device, or iPad. 
Hmm, kind of a catchy name, uh, but they didn't stick with it, and it was simply known as the Eye Opener by the time it launched in autumn of 99. And that was only online or by phone. It didn't hit physical retailers until early in 2000, at stores like Circuit City and CompUSA, the latter of which is where mine would have been originally purchased back in the day. Though as you might expect, I found mine in its box while thrifting over a decade ago now. Not quite complete, but close enough for me to happily take it home. Inside was the system itself, a keyboard and mouse combo peripheral, a fluff-filled welcome letter and membership privacy policy info, and a 1.84 amp wall wart power supply providing 19 volts of pizza ordering power. There's also an instruction manual, packing 90 pages, covering all the basic setup and troubleshooting tips you'd expect, along with plenty of Q&A sections for newbies and testimonials from existing eye-opened users going on about how excited they were to use it for years to come. Surely it'll last years, right? The package also would have come with a telephone cord, but it's missing. No problem, just go out into the wild and you can find those things all over the place. And I still have the Goodwill receipt from when I bought it in 2012, too. Not bad, 15 bucks for a nice working system. Er, well, decently nice. It could do with a cleaning, which I never got around to back then, so let's take care of that real quick. Luckily, it appears to be lightly used, with very little in the way of wear and tear. Just some stains, grime, and a few particularly smudgy areas where something rubbed up on it and left some stubborn marks. The rest is your mandatory dirt and dust from use and neglect, and what appears to be makeup, if I had to guess? Like someone was applying foundation while using it? But yeah, nothing a brief scrub and wipe down couldn't fix. And with that, we have quite the fresh looking eye opener. So let's plug it in and give it a go. And there we go. A rather silent startup experience. Makes sense as it doesn't have a hard drive or big fans inside, only a flash drive for storage and a low profile cooler in there somewhere. And you can see here it says, uh, yeah, no dial tone. Your eye opener could not connect over the phone line. That's because there's nothing to connect to. And I also don't have a phone line plugged in. But yeah, this right here is what you're greeted with on startup. And while it did take a minute or so to boot up from cold, this never fully powers down until you unplug it. So even if you press the power button right there, pressing it again just brings it right back. It puts it into a standby mode. And that's really the whole idea is to just have it always on for your convenience, but also so it could dial into the NetPlant's servers to download content and OS updates anytime. Yeah, on the note of the operating system, what we have here is built on QNX version 4.25 which is a Unix-like microkernel system by Quantum Software Systems in Canada, later owned by RIM or BlackBerry. And on startup, you're greeted with this home page and eight shortcut buttons, which are pretty self-explanatory, but uh, yeah, weather, finance, sports, entertainment, news, those are all personalized internet content. Uh, the web guide and shopping are just a collection of links to different places you can do that online and mail is email. Imagine that. But yeah, this thing is designed to never power off downloading your emails, news articles, weather forecasts, stocks, or whatever else in the background periodically without user involvement, which would have been pretty cool in the late 90s. It just caches everything away for later access by the user, which also means that each one of these functions like a time capsule of the last moment it ever went online. And this particular unit right here, as far as it's concerned, it's still 2002, uh, December 31st, 2002 to be precise. Just press the home key right here and get back to this. And yeah, let's open up some of these things that are still cached from the last time it was online. So apparently it was in Elmira, New York uh, by the previous owner where it was 57 degrees 
clear and calm. 89% humidity. Oh my goodness, look at this forecast. No, okay, so this is April 2002 for this forecast. So maybe that's the last time it was online and the clock is still just counting up. It's weird, like the clock, you can't even change or adjust. And uh, I mean, this thing is so locked down. I mean, even looking in the manual, when you look up how to adjust the date and time, it's like, you can't, not by yourself. Call 1-800-EYE-OPENER and then ask customer care to change it for you. So I can't even open that up to see exactly what it thinks the date is. Uh, let's just go to the news. This is a good example of the last time it was online. Yeah, more April 2002 stuff. So apparently three winning tickets were sold in a $325 million lottery. That seems so very small in the days here of like $1.3 billion lotteries. But yeah, look at all these headlines here on the side. So we've got a U.S. concludes Bin Laden escaped Tora Bora. Uh, Powell says Sharon gives timeline on withdrawal. Bush to give Americans update in the war on terrorism. This is very, very 2002 stuff. Yeah, September 11th probes. This is kind of funny too, also in the, the days of 2023. New York City hits 91. Ooh, breaks 106 year old temperature mark. And you can really see that uh, <laughs> unfortunate passive matrix display here doing its thing. It's very easy to lose the mouse cursor, but you know, considering you're just looking at text and a few images here and there, it's not the worst. And we are really limited though, in terms of what we can open up and see, because of course, it's just whatever's cached on here is what we've got. So we can't just go and connect and see any of these other things. But yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty nifty to, again, to just see this fascinating moment in time. Apparently Ford had a fourth straight quarterly loss then. Pfizer earnings surge on strong sales. Hmm, some things never change. Office Depot says their profits are rising. <laughs> oh, 2002. That's uh, wonderful. What kind of sports news do we have here? ESPN.com is the sponsor for this. Uh, the Bucks step forward in playoff race. Anna Kornikova, that's a name I haven't heard in forever in sports. Uh, entertainment, I'm sure this is fun. Tartan Parade brings up the 10,000 bagpipers to New York. This very much seems uh, geared towards the area that you're in, which is interesting. <laughs> World's media pullout stops for Queen Mother. Yeah, she was still around. How old was she at that point? Yeah, 101 year old royal matriarch. Anyway, uh, Mr. Showbiz was apparently the sponsorship for the entertainment section, whatever that is or was. Oh, this is great. 2002, once again, showing its 2002 and its music companies still looking for online hit. <laughs> Celine Dion's new album this week gave record giant Sony Music reason to both cheer and weep. The CD topped sales charts, but also infuriated fans in Europe when the disc copyright protection technology sent computers crashing. Dude, this is that Sony rootkit thing, wasn't it? There was some garbage going on back then. We intend to get the majority of the world's music content into the press play service sooner rather than later. And we continue to talk to all the music companies about offering the most flexible rights possible for the content. Okay, yeah. You get the idea of the, uh, the wonderfulness that is captured on each of these machines that is still working and has the storage intact. It's kind of interesting to just turn on any of them and see when the last time it was online. Now, unfortunately, there's not a ton of stuff stored on there and it is mostly text. There were some emails from the previous owner, but I think I've already deleted them. Not like there was much here to see, but yeah, I was gonna say there was um, only 16 megabytes of flash storage in here, split up into four partitions and a whopping seven megabytes was available to the user or so, you know, yeah, definitely quite a bit in terms of text. But yeah, this web guide really is just a collection of links to various websites uh, that they wanted you to visit or they had partnerships with or, you know, whatever. I don't even think you could customize these. Let's see what's in the food here. Better Homes Kitchen, cooking.com, Epicurious, Food Network, <laughs> reference, Ask Jeeves. And of course you could just open the web browser that it came with. So go to any website you wanted to, whatever, man. Obviously not a thing anymore. And then the shopping, uh, again, just a collection of links, but instead of clicking a list of links, you, you click these little areas in this non-existent little digital mall. Yeah, again, a lot of these are still around, but many of them are very much gone. And that's about all that you could have done with this back in the day. I mean, you've pretty much 
seen it here. The, the limited storage and the limited everything uh, and being so locked down and lack of being able to customize stuff, at least easily, it was really just an internet appliance. You couldn't even open or read many email attachments or web downloaded files. It just didn't let you do that. That stuff was locked down. Other than it's like simple text and image files. I think that's about all you could open. Interestingly though, there is this audio section and this would let you stream like real player, real network music, like those kind of playlists at very, very low bit rates, I assume. But again, can't do anything here with that now. It doesn't let you play audio files or anything, but I don't even think it lets you open those. This is a kind of an oddity too. It does actually have a microphone on here. You might wonder, what does that do? Well, uh, nothing <laughs> at all. Uh, it's not utilized. I believe it was planned for some kind of future thing. There's something in the manual here. Yeah, what's the microphone for? It's a feature we plan to incorporate into the eye opener in the future. That never happened. It does actually support printing as well. Yeah, got the parallel port right there. But to my knowledge, there's only one printer or like series of printers that were allowed. That being the Canon Bubblejet 2010 or 2000 series that of course they had a partnership to sell themselves for $99, the same price as this was originally. And reportedly they also offered a USB mouse that you could plug in right here, but I've never actually seen pictures of that or anything, just mentions of it online. Uh, and of course, if you want, I've actually uh, taken off this little panel here, but when you first get the thing that's covered up, so where you can't remove the keyboard, but yeah, you, you can't, you just unscrew that and it's just standard PS2. So if you use a PS2 Y splitter, you can plug in a regular PS2 mouse and keyboard that way. Yeah, intriguingly, you can also access the RAM right here. I don't think there's any real benefit to it on this particular setup, the way it is here anyway. But yeah, that is about it, really. Uh, other than, of course, that delightful pizza key, which was seriously sold as one of the uh, machine's key quirks and, you know, selling points, honestly. Although it no doubt caused some confusion uh, if the manual is anything to go by. With multiple sections going over, like, well, what in the world is the pizza key even for? And these little Q&A bits being like, I was typing something on the screen, all of a sudden, it told me to order a pizza, what's going on? Well, you accidentally hit the pizza key. And yeah, it's no wonder, cause it's right there beside the daggum space bar, kind of a prime location. Since I'm kind of talking about it anyway, the keyboard itself is, um, uh, it's not the worst. It's just extremely light and plasticky and uh, it feels ridiculously cheap, but that is to be expected considering how low cost everything was on here. Uh, but you know, the keycaps themselves feel okay. They're kind of like three quarter profile in height. The membrane is just rubber domes. It's fine, nothing great. It's like a step below late 90s Packard Bell. And of course there's the mouse nub or disc. You know, it works pretty okay <laughs> for what it is. And it also has these two mouse buttons, which you would think one would be left and right, but they both do the same thing. At Thought maybe I was just missing something, but uh, looking in the manual here, it says the action of pressing either one is how you click the mouse. So just whichever one you prefer. But yeah, as it was from the factory out of the box, that, that's what you could do, which was again, pretty neat at the time. But you know, for all their claims of this just being web without a PC or shrink wrapping and packing up the internet to present to consumers in a convenient, non-computer package. I mean, it's <laughs> it's still a computer. This is a PC inside. So uh, let's take a look in there. Well, that was significantly more <laughs> troublesome to get into than I thought it would be. I, mean, I knew I had one of the later models here where they purposely made it difficult to get into to try and prevent modification, but what a pain. Anyway, quite a heat sink. I guess it's all passively cooled. I thought there was a little fan in here, but maybe that was just on earlier models. 
in terms of specifications, you can see a, a number of things listed straight up in the manual, like the uh, 800 by 600 display, 16,000 colors, 32 megabyte RAM, the built-in modem and all that kind of stuff. And there is the vague mention of an x86 200 megahertz processor. There we go. It's just a uh, socket seven. Oh yeah, that's very dry. It's not quite what I was expecting. So we have a, a Ryze MP6 266, which is a socket seven CPU, but uh, one that I actually haven't heard of and different than what I read was in here. Yeah, I think mainly in the earlier ones you had one of these, an IDT Win chip. So this is a 180 megahertz version, but 200 megahertz was also a thing as this one would have normally had, but I guess this is just called 266. It just says two times 100 megahertz bus. Yeah, the CPU is 266 megahertz rated, but really 200 megahertz, it's 2X100. So we have a Trident Cyberblade i7 chip there for graphics. Of course, there's a VIA chip too. A couple of SanDisk chips down here for the flash storage, presumably. There's the little IDE connector, which is actually covered up on this one by this gigantic heatsink. They didn't want you using that. And I believe that right there is the BIOS chip, also locking things out on this version. Of course, the RAM right there, this daughter board here for the modem communication stuff, CR2032 battery, and yeah, yeah, you know, it's laptop stuff. It's, it's just a PC. And that's what made it so appealing. And of course, what ended up being a lot of its downfall, at least on earlier versions where it was so easy to bypass that flash storage and put whatever you want on here. And you know, seeing all this, that finally brings us to the point that I'm sure many of you are aware of, and that is the fact that this was such a low cost PC meant that the technologically curious and hardware inclined snapped these things up for cheap and immediately started hacking away. You know, as soon as they got in there and saw what was going on, I mean, yeah, it was only a matter of time before people got the hardware doing different things than it was intended and slapped Linux on there or Windows 98 or whatever, man. It's an x86 architecture system. You can do pretty much whatever you want with it. So it was not long before that $99 initial price went up to $299. And you know what? It still was losing money because it costs like 500 bucks to manufacture. So NetPliance scrambled to adjust and tweak the hardware so that hopefully it wouldn't be so easy to hack with middling results, put a lock on something like this and people are just gonna wanna try to pick it. But you know, they still had an IPO in March of 2000 and NetPliance stocks raised $144 million, but it was not long before they absolutely nosedived after the problems with the system and its whole philosophy and hackability and many, many other things came to a head and they lost $186 million in the year 2000 alone. Ended up being traded for pennies by April of 2001 yeah, you know, there was that whole dot-com bubble bursting and all those kind of things. And you know what? Uh, just look at this chart. It's so sad. This was in the newspaper back in the day and you know, just like NetPliance is doomed. It came out that NetPliance would have had to have had 500,000 users to hit the break-even point. All those people paying $21.95 a month. And instead, at the peak, it seems they only had around 50,000 paying monthly users. Eh, it's no surprise, they were just bleeding cash, their stock was in the toilet, and they ended manufacturing and support of the eye-opener in November of 2000, and stopped sales entirely in January of 2001. Now, Earthlink actually swooped in and bought the eye-opener service and took it over and offered access for a bit, but, you know, obviously that wasn't even going to last either. Earthlink shut it down at some point in 2002, from what I can tell, probably around the time that mine was last online in April or so. That being said, though, it wasn't all awful for the people behind NetPliance. They went on to become Tipping Point Technologies, completely pivoted their focus, and they started doing security products and network intrusion prevention systems. And they actually lasted in some form until 2015, when the company was purchased for $300 million by Trend Micro, who are very much still around with a net worth of like $6 billion as of July 2023. Hence the tipping point threat protection system, which is 
that's what that is. <laughs> it comes from net clients, or at least the people that were involved with it. And well, that is about it for this system, this video anyway. As much as I would love to show the process of hacking this thing and getting another OS on there of some kind, unfortunately, mine is one of the later models that has a number of things that have been adjusted to make modifying the OS kind of difficult from what I've read online. Not impossible, but just a little bit out of the scope of this video. You know, there's BIOS updates and some hardware changes and stuff like that. You do need a customized IDE cable regardless of the model, which I do have. It just swaps around a number of the pins and you can actually still get these online. I got this one on eBay. But yeah, the BIOS changes and some other things on the motherboard too. Uh, yeah, I just don't have any way to adjust that right now. So maybe in the future, we'll see. I, I would definitely love to get something else running on here so I can actually use this as like a weird little Socket 7 PC. But anyway, if you've ever had a Netpliance eye-opener in the past, or maybe you still do, or maybe you've modified one already and you know what the process is like, yeah, put some information in the comments, your story, whatever. I think it's fascinating, this whole net appliance era. Yeah, it's still kind of fun to just see what it was supposed to do, especially when they have information cached on it. But that is about it for this episode of LGR. I hope that you enjoyed seeing this bit of nonsense. And as always, thank you for watching.